Good morning. Well, it's good morning for me. I, it's five in the morning in Melbourne. Uh, Austin is in Austin, Texas, just so that it's easy for everyone to know where he is. Is that right, Austin? That's right. We're uh, in the middle of South by Southwest, so we're having a good time here in Austin. Okay. I'm going to briefly describe the, uh, the structure of the webinar. Most of uh, the hour is going to be storytelling and uh, you feel free to ask your questions as we go through. Um, the two webinars are structured around a book that I wrote um, called Seven Stories Every Salesperson Must Tell. The seven stories are seven story types. And the book is split into four parts. And the parts are around a fishing analogy. So the analogy is that we're, we're going to create a lure which is our story and use the different special types of lures at different times through the sales process through the buying cycle and um, the seven stories these are the seven stories and i'm going to go into the first of the three stories your personal story your key staff or key person story and your company creation story today on this webinar and then next webinar i'll go into the the final four stories, which are your insight stories, success stories, value stories, and teaching stories. The stories are distinguished by the, the central, central character that you use. So which character is the person that you're talking about in the story is what distinguishes the, what type of story it is. So these are the seven stories and the character is written here in yellow. So in the personal story, when you tell your personal story, you will be the central character. When you tell a story about a key person in your company, they will be the, per the central character, etc. And we'll go into detail on each of these story types so that you understand exactly what sort of story you're telling and how to cast the person who is central to each of those stories. So just to recap, so today we're going to be talking about what exactly stories are, why you should tell stories, uh, how to create a story, and then we're going to talk about the stories for building rapport, for rapport building and connection, how to get across that you're an authority and that you're credible. So those are the first three stories. And then next week, same time next week, in webinar two, we're going to talk about the deal making i call them the deal making stories the stories for changing your your buyer's mind changing your future customer's mind and helping to close the deal so you're going to have to come along for two uh, webinars to get both of these and we'll take it nice and slowly step by step ask questions at any time austin will be monitoring your questions he'll interrupt me and and ask if he feels there's an important question there so please do Go ahead and do that. Okay, so webinar one, we're going to talk about crafting stories. Why must salespeople tell stories? I'm going to tell my personal story in a few minutes so that you start to understand exactly what stories, what they look like, how long they are, and how they're structured. But let's just start with why must salespeople tell stories? When I started writing Seven Stories, this was a question that uh, really interested me. And, and at the top here of this slide, you can see the answers that are most commonly given. If you were to buy uh, any textbook on storytelling, whether that's business storytelling or storytelling for change management or storytelling for sales, and there aren't very many books on storytelling for sales, you'll read things like, well, <clears throat> we've been telling stories for generations we've been telling stories probably for more than 200,000 years and we have a fabulous success record in fact we only invented writing about 5,000 years ago so humans have been telling stories and passing information on from father to son from mother to daughter through the generations as a way to pass on culture for hundreds of thousands of years so that's a pretty good reason to tell stories. Obviously, there must be something about stories that means that they work. 
there's been many scientific studies on remembering stories and it's been found that we remember stories far better than we remember disassociated facts and um, I think it's easy for, for most of you to confirm you might know that there's a thing called the uh, the memory games there's a, an annual event called memory games and they have certain um, certain games that are played every year and one of them is called one hour cards you're given a, a pack of playing cards, uh, 52 cards in a pack, and they're shuffled, and you get one hour to memorize as many cards in sequence as you can. And the people who are brilliant at that, at, mem at that memory game, the current world champion can remember um, 21 packs of cards randomly shuffled in sequence. And the way that they do that is create a story each card is either a, a person or a place or a room in a building. And as they're remembering the sequence of cards, they create the story in their mind about that character, maybe the Queen of Hearts, moving to the room of the Three of Diamonds uh, and then picking up an object, maybe the, the Ten of Clubs object. And that, that creates a picture, a story in the mind of the person trying to remember the cards and they can remember an incredible number of cards. And you could too, if you learned that technique, maybe not quite as well as the world champion, but if you learned that technique, you would also be able to remember an enormous number of things because you're putting it in the form that we can easily remember things, which is sequences, a story in a sequence. When we tell stories in business meetings, most people don't notice that we're telling a story but they remember that story that we told. So it's a good thing to do because if you tell a story, a short story in a business meeting and you put into that story the information that you want to pass over, you'll be telling it in a format that your listeners will remember. They'll just remember that little story that you told them, but they won't notice so much that you told a story because we, we don't really notice it. So that's a curious thing about stories. In fact, our brains are wired to remember and learn from stories. And the reason is the biggest part of our brain, the neocortex, which is the large wrinkly part on the outside of your brain, if you were to hold two fists in front of your face like that, hold them together, that's about the size of your brain, your cortex, your neocortex, and it's actually in two halves, and it's all wrinkly like your fingers like that. And if you were to lay it flat, in two halves, the biggest part of your brain, 80% of your brain is, is neocortex. And if you were to lay it flat, it is a big sheet about the size of a dinner napkin, about the size of a, a tea towel, depending on if you're in North America or if you're in, in Europe, about two or three millimeters thick, 30 billion nerve cells. And what those nerve cells are doing, those neurons, what they're doing is continuously predicting what's going to happen next. So your brain is learning sequences, things that happen that are patterns that repeat, and it's predicting what's going to happen next. It's predicting what you're going to see and what you're going to hear. And you would have predicted that I was going to say the word here. And it's also predicting how you're going to feel, how your internal body feels when, when you're hearing the story. And you'll, you'll, you'll feel how the character of the story is feeling you'll feel their emotion as well because we're able to project our feelings into someone else when we hear a story and this is why stories are so powerful because when we hear a story of someone else someone that we care about if the story is told well enough we can project ourselves into that person and we can learn from their experience so stories are a way of experiencing something that somebody else experienced. So we don't have to learn only what we experience ourselves as humans because we tell stories. We learn what all the other people have learnt when they tell us their story. So when someone tells us a story, we're learning from it and we're predicting what's going to happen next to that person. So that's the wonderful thing about stories. <clears throat> 
So our brains are wired, our neocortex is wired to remember and learn from stories. Now, stories are very important in sales conversations because when we meet a new client for the first time, they typically don't. Hey, Mike. Us. Mike, yep. sorry to uh, we can't see your uh, presentation uh, right now. Aha, good. How's that there now? Better, thank you. Okay, there's two things I have to do on this uh, go to uh, switch one on and one off. Okay, so I'm down the bottom on this slide. Uh, so stories, stories are something that people remember. We we learn from stories, but they also have a very important part in the sales conversation when we're meeting someone for the first time, because we can pass information that we should be trusted and that we're credible, that we know what we're talking about in a way that your buyer, your future client can easily accept. And also stories avoid the problem of mis mismatch. If I tell you a fact, and I've been telling you some facts, I've put a fact right here on the top of this slide, which says there's a 200 year success record for stories. That's a fact. If I tell a fact in a business meeting as a salesperson who doesn't really know that client very well yet, there's a good chance that they push back, that they don't accept your fact. Your client might think, no, it's not 200,000 years, it's only 100,000 years or something like that. You tend to push back against facts, but we don't push back against stories. We just listen to stories. So stories avoid the problem of pushback or mismatch. There's a good book that I recommend in Seven Stories. It's called The Secrets of Question-Based Selling. And in that book, Tom Fries, the author, says that pushback or mismatch is the instinctive tendency of individuals to resist or to push back in a contrarian manner. And they do that when there is a fact. Whenever we present a fact without properly explaining that fact, whenever we make an assertion, whenever we say um, that Zoho is the number one CRM in the world, if, if I was to say that, in your mind, you might be pushing back and you might be thinking, no, there's probably some other CRM or something like that. So we don't want to say, facts like that we want to put that information in a story and the first step to avoiding mismatch and push match pushback is to notice when you're making statements and assertions and to try not to try not to make them in your first client meeting try to use questions and stories and avoid pushback when i was now i'm going to tell my first story now normally normally i don't tell my clients that I'm going to tell a story um, because a lot of people think stories are not that, um, are not, maybe, maybe I'm just telling a story and it's not the truth. So I don't use the word story in a business meeting and that's important, but I'm just going to tell the story. But because this is a training webinar, I'm going to tell you when I start my stories and just so that you notice that I'm starting, right? So when I was working in Malaysia about six or seven years ago, I had an important business meeting with the CTO of a large telecommunications company, one of the biggest mobile network providers in Malaysia. And I was meeting that CTO with a technical expert from my company. I was working for Nokia at the time. And um, so we went into the meeting and at the start of the meeting, I started asking some questions of the CTO. One of the questions I asked was how many, and I, I, how, I was not typically working with the CTO. This was a first meeting with that, with that, with that CTO. And I asked him, how many mobile base station towers do you have in your mobile phone network? And before he could answer that question, my technic, uh, so he said, sorry, I asked him how many towers are there? He said there are 5,000. And before I could say anything, my technical sales guy said, no, no, there's only 4,911. Well, that's, an, that's a, an example of pushback. The CTO, the client, gave a fact, 5,000, 
And the technical guy who wanted to appear important, I think, said, no, no, there's only 5,911. Now, I kicked that guy under the table and brought the, the conversation back to ask my next question. But that's what happens when we deliver a fact. You get this pushback. Someone wants to correct you or they want to say, no, it's not like that. But that doesn't happen when we tell a story. So that's a good reason to start telling stories. And when you have important information, don't deliver it as a fact, but deliver it as a story, because then you won't get pushback. All right, so let's talk about what stories are exactly, and then we'll move on to talking about the specific stories for building rapport. What I'm showing you here is a pictogram, a graphic of the events of the story. So each of these circles here represents an event. Now, when I told the story about being in Malaysia seven or eight years ago and going to meet the CTO of a mobile network company, I was telling you the setting. I was setting here the start of the story. And the setting is very important. If you don't start your story the right way, people won't know that you're telling a story and they won't necessarily listen properly for the story. But when you start it by giving a time and a place, so seven or eight years ago in Malaysia, people can say, okay, there's a story coming. Now I'm going to jump onto the whiteboard for a second while I talk about this. If, if we tell a story to a child and we say once upon a time, then you know that there's a fairy tale coming. You know that there's a story coming and the child will just relax and be attentively listening to the story. If you give a time and a place, it has exactly the same effect in a business story. If I say at this time in this place, you know that I'm about to tell a story and you listen and you know one more thing, I'm about to tell a true story. If I say once upon a time, you know that it's probably not a true story, it's probably just a fairy tale. So when I give the time and place, I'm signaling that this is going to be a true story. And that's very important because in business, we should, I think, tell true stories. We should only tell true stories. Maybe you wanna ask some questions about that, but that's my opinion. Now we're gonna move into the next event, which I call the complication event. Something has to happen in the story that we couldn't quite predict what it is, what's going to happen. So when I said that the CTO was, you know, I asked the CTO how many worlds, how many um, mobile towers there were in the network, you don't know why I'm saying that. You don't know what's going to happen. And the complication is that instead of my CTO answering the question, my customer, my technical sales guy jumped in and told that story. It's not a particularly fabulous story, but it's still a little anecdote and it has a complication in it. And then we're going to resolve the story. So I resolved that story just by saying, well, and then I kick the guy under the table and ask the next question. So that's how I resolve the story. And then we're gonna make a business point. So we're gonna make a business point. Now, when we tell stories in a business meeting, we have to make a point. We have to be making a point, making a relevant, important point. Otherwise, people will think we're just wasting their time. And we don't want that. We're, we're meeting a CTO, someone important. We can't waste their time. We have to tell stories that are relevant and make an important point. Now, I told you the story about meeting the CTO because I wanted to make a point. And the point is one about pushback. If we just deliver facts and the CTO delivered facts, then you can get pushback. Someone will argue. And, and not believe or not agree. They may not actually say, I don't believe you, but in their mind, they're not believing you. So a setting, time and a place, some kind of complication, resolve that to make a business point. So those are the critical elements of a story. We must have them. 
So how do, let's just go through them one at a time. So let's talk about sequence of events first. So I say that a story must have a sequence of related events. What do I mean by that? I mean that at this time and place in this setting, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, and then this happened. If it's not a sequence of events, it's not a story. That's the first definition of a story. Now, you can do a little exercise for yourself. You can just write, put into Google, our story, and you'll get hundreds of companies who have written our story somewhere in their website. And if you click on one of those, you'll find that probably 95% of them will say something like, we were founded in 1985 in Australia. Good, that's an event, that's a setting in fact. And then the next thing they'll say is, and we're the number one company in this and that, and we're based in New York, London and Sydney. And suddenly it's not a story. Those are assertions, they're facts, they're not an event, they don't relate to the starting event, so it's not a story. So one of the problems with the word story is people say story all the time, but they're not telling a story, So, and it's not a story, so people get confused about what a story is. So I would like for you to not be confused. I would like you to be 100% certain that it has to have a sequence of events or it's not a story. It must have a starting setting, and it needs a central character. Now, the easiest stories to tell in business are the stories of things that happen to you, and you will be the central character. But I'm going to teach you some other stories where there are other people who are the central character. And to be good salespeople, we need to know how to tell other people's stories, because otherwise we're limited by our own experience. And we represent, most of us, we represent a company, we have other people who also have important stories to tell, and we need to tell those stories. And we also need to be able to tell the stories of our other clients and other people in our industry. So we need to know how to tell other people's stories. I say there has to be a central character, a single central character. Our stories, our business stories become much less interesting as soon as we have more than one central character. And you, and you might have noticed this already. Do you, do you notice that charity organizations, when they're appealing to you to give to a charity, they will talk about an individual person very often a child. They'll tell you about this particular child in Africa or in some poverty-stricken area. And there's a reason for that, because the studies have shown that we are far more likely to donate to a charity if we hear a story about a single individual than if there's more than one character. So the studies, for example, will set up a situation and, and talk about one child, and then they will measure how many donations they get. And then they'll add, maybe they talked about a little girl, and then they'll add the girl's brother to the story. And then they get less donations. And then they'll talk about their family, and they'll get less donations. And then they'll talk about 5,000 or 100,000 people in the same situation, and they get even less donations to the charity. And the reason is we cannot empathize we cannot put ourselves into a multi-character story we need to put ourselves into a single character so that we can experience that story so we want to make sure that our stories happen they turn on the events of a single character and then they'll be compelling stories as i tell the stories today um you'll i'll tell you you'll, you'll probably notice as well who the character is but you'll notice that they're about a single character there has to be unpredictability and surprise in your story. Otherwise, it's not very interesting. So it's not a very interesting story. And it has to make a business point. Okay. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to tell the first story, which is the personal story.
Now you have a, a worksheet, a handout. Download that handout to your desktop. And I'm going to tell my personal story. <clears throat> and what I'd like you to do is have a think about your own personal story as I tell it. And I'm going to show you the events of my personal story as I tell it. And some space. Okay. So I just wait for the camera to come in and out of focus. So uh, well, I'm trained as an electrical and mechanical engineer, and I had absolutely no intention of being a salesperson. I grew up in Tasmania, which is a state to the south of Australia, and I trained to be an engineer. And I was very fortunate. I got a job working for a multinational company called Schlumberger, and they sent me to work all around the world. I worked as an engineer in Indonesia, in China, and in Malaysia, and then I was transferred to the United Kingdom, to London, and I was working on software for analyzing rocks classifying rocks actually i was working on very early artificial intelligence software uh, called a deep neural network and one day my boss called me into his office and he said mike we've got a fantastic career opportunity for you and when you hear that and you've worked in a big company for a while you you, you learn to appreciate that it probably means a job nobody else wants but what he said was mike we want you to take on a sales role and go to Norway. And I heard sales role and I thought, no, I don't want to do that. And then I heard Norway and I thought, ooh, would like to go to Norway. That sounds pretty interesting. But what I said was, well, I don't think I can go to Norway because my wife is eight months pregnant. She was having a second child in a month's time. So I can't, we can't really transfer to Norway. And then went home, talked with my wife that night and she pretty adventurous person. She'd lived all over the world herself and she did want to go to Norway and we agreed to go and we flew to Norway one month before our second child was born and I decided I took on the job of learning how to be a salesperson. And if anyone is on this webinar as a technical person, you'll know that it's not easy to learn how to, to be a salesperson. Um, you have to learn how to stop being a technical person to learn how to be a salesperson. And I was very lucky in my first year. Our second child was born there. That's one thing to be lucky about. I have three boys. But I was extremely fortunate because in that first year of selling, I sold the biggest deal in our division, in our corporation worldwide from Stavanger in Norway. And it was almost 100% luck, good luck for me. I just happened to meet exactly the right person. And that person really sold for me a corporate software system. We were selling software, they sold that deal for me. So I'm telling you a story and I started, and it started back in 1996 in Norway. So that's the setting. And I told you something personal in my story. I told you that my wife is pregnant, eight months pregnant, that's pretty personal. And I'm going to encourage you to put personal things in your story, and I'll explain why in a minute. And then there was a complication. I didn't want to be a salesperson, but I did want to go to Norway. So you can't predict what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to Norway. So that's something interesting in the stories. So that's a complication. So there's, there's a complication here. And then that got me into sales, and I ended up running sales teams throughout Europe. I ran a sales team in Russia. I lived in Moscow with our three boys. And then it was time to come back to live in Australia for a couple of reasons. My dad was not very well back in Tasmania. And we decided to settle in Melbourne, which is in Victoria, in the mainland of Australia. And I didn't know anybody in Melbourne apart from my sister. That was the only person I knew in Melbourne. And I needed a job. And there's no oil and gas industry. I was selling oil and gas software and there's no oil and gas industry in Melbourne. So how was I going to get a job? And I wasn't very sure. In fact, for a few months, I was kind of worrying that I would not get a job. I'd spent a lot of time working overseas. I didn't really know anyone in Melbourne. But I did start to meet people and I was telling my story and people started telling my story. And I got called by a guy who said, would you be interested in working in telecommunications? And I know I told a very good story because I got a job 
in an industry that I didn't know anything about, which was telecommunications, selling equipment that I didn't know anything about, which was mobile networks, to the biggest telecommunications company in Australia, which I didn't know anything about. So I wasn't really ideally suited for that job, but I told a good interview story, and I know what that story was, and I still know the person, I'm still friends with the person that I told that story to. So here's another complication. Mike needed a job, and I told a story. And then after that, we were transferred overseas again to Malaysia. I changed industry again. I went back to oil and gas and worked for Halliburton. And then I changed industry again when it was time to come back to Australia again. And I worked in the facility services industry, selling catering and cooking services in very big deals, 30, 40 million dollar deals in the mining and oil and gas camps in Western Australia. And then I changed industry again and went to work for a company called Motorola. And then I was sick of working for big companies and I decided to start out on my own in a consulting business. Actually, I had a couple of business partners and, we, and I really wanted to see if I could solve the problem that I had when I was a sales manager because I'd been running big sales teams. I was sales manager of teams up to about 140 people when I worked in Nokia. And the problem I had was how do you improve salespeople how do you get them performing better because what every sales manager discovers is that you have about 10 percent of your sales team that seem to know what they're doing and they sort of naturally pick it up and they do well and then you have about 10 or 20 percent that probably shouldn't be salespeople, and you need to kind of move them out and then you have a whole group in the middle that sometimes hit their target but they mostly don't and they never seem to improve very much and this is a recurring problem. And I had that problem in five different industries. And that was my desire, how to fix that problem. And I started doing what most people in B2B sales do is we, I taught questioning skills and listening skills and how to manage pipeline and all those things. And I wasn't very effective. And I know I wasn't effective because I would call the salespeople up after six months and ask them what they remembered and they remembered nothing. But then I started teaching what I had used, which is storytelling. And I started to teach how to tell stories. And then when I rang them up six months later and asked them what they remembered, they had remembered what I told them and they had remembered how to tell the stories. And this was my light bulb moment when I realized that I could teach stories and teach storytelling and improve their sales skills. And then they would ring me up and tell me, I told that story and, and I won that deal. Or I, I Suddenly I know that client that much better and we're getting on much better. When I hear the effect of the stories, then I know that this really works. And then last year, middle of last year, I released my book, which is seven stories every salesperson must tell. It's still on sale. You can get the ebook for $2.99. And that is the handbook and if you really don't need to take notes today, just get the book because everything that I'm talking about today, you'll have in much more detail in that book. So today I work with customers all over the world. I'm currently arranging to do work in Canada, in Europe, throughout Australia, and I teach storytelling. But that's my career path. I started as an engineer. I didn't want to be a salesperson. I was very lucky. I had some experiences that led me to notice something about storytelling, and then I started a business doing that. Now, I've told you that story in about five minutes, and normally I'll tell it in about two minutes. The reason I've taken a little bit more time in this story is to break it up for you and to show you how it works. Now, what point, what point am I making in this story? What is the business point? Well, the point of telling, there's, there's three main points of telling a business story. The first point is to show you that I'm credible. I know what I'm talking about when it comes to sales and storytelling. And that I'm an authority. When I tell you I wrote a book about this and I've been doing it in all these different countries and all of these different companies, I'm an authority. I know something about this topic. Now, we don't want to say to our clients, I'm an authority and I know what I'm talking about. But if we tell a story 
that demonstrates that, we pass that information along for free. They'll get that information. So I'm credible, I'm an authority. But here's the most important reason for telling that story. When I finish the story, I'm going to say some magic words. And the words are something like this. Well, enough about me. What about you? How did you get into your role? How did you become the head of this department? How did you get to be CTO of this company? And they'll tell their story. Now, they probably won't be as well practiced as you. They won't have practiced telling their story. They won't have thought about it. But if you told something personal in your story, and notice I mentioned something personal, I said something about my wife, and I told you that our second child, our second of three sons, was born in Norway. I gave something personal. And when you put something personal in your personal story, they're going to probably give you something personal back. You'll hear something personal from them as well. And that's gold because I say that the start of a friendship, friendship starts when you share personal stories. So you tell that personal story and they tell their story, you're sharing stories and you, your relationship really starts at that point. So that's a very important point. And if you don't remember anything other, uh, from today's webinar, other than that you should tell your personal story, you should practice it before you tell it so that you can get it down to a couple of minutes. And then you should ask your future customer for their story. Enough about me, what about you? Tell me your story, tell me about yourself. And then you'll get to know them. Now we tend not to do this in business meetings. We tend not to share personal stories, but if you notice the very excellent salespeople, you'll notice that they do do that. So timing wise, less than three minutes. Now I highly recommend that you pair up, that you work with a colleague to work on your personal story because um, people often don't appreciate what is interesting about themselves. <clears throat> when I was um, first starting to run story workshops uh, quite a few years ago now, four years ago, <clears throat> I worked with a friend of mine, Tabitha. Now, you might notice I'm telling you a story again, guys. I'll just flag that here is another story. Um, so Tabitha, um, I worked with her in, in Nokia in telecommunications and she was starting out in her own consulting business at the same time in change management and she is um, a very matter of fact she's a technical person and she likes to talk about facts and figures and she's not really a very personable person but i encouraged her to tell her personal story and i was working with her on what she should tell and what she should put in her story and what she should leave out and she told me about starting working in local governments, very complicated change projects with multiple stakeholders, different governments. And then she got a job as a bid manager and she didn't even know what bid management meant in a big corporation. She was telling me all of these facts about her career and I couldn't understand how she got started. And I asked her, well, what did you study at university? Or, you know, did you go to college? What, what, what was your, what's your topic that you learned at school? And she said she studied anthropology. I thought, wow, you're into change management and you go into organizations and you help them understand how to change. And anthropology sounds like the perfect training. Why wouldn't you mention that in your, in your personal story? And she did. She put that into her personal story. In fact, her business card says corporate anthropologist. And a week or so after she worked on her personal story, she called me up and she said, Mike, I had a a business conversation on the phone with a potential partner in London, a, a lady, and I, 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 I forced myself to tell my personal story and I told it. And then she told me her personal story and my God, I, I couldn't stop her. She told me all sorts of things that I think even her husband doesn't know. And, and now it seems like we're the best of friends and it really works. So she told her story and it really works. The reason I told you that story, the point of telling you that story is that quite often, we don't know what's interesting about our own stories, but if we work with another person and we get them to interview us and get them to tell our story back to us, we can hear it and we can work out what's interesting in that story in a collaborative exercise.
So when you download that handout, you'll see there's a worksheet there which you can write into the events of your personal story. I suggest that you, you work with someone else in your company and say, look, I'll help you with your personal story, you help me with mine. And you'll find that that goes um, much better than just trying to do this exercise completely on your own. Okay, so it's, this is not a heroic story, by the way. We're not trying to, um, we're not trying to make ourselves a hero. We're going to show some vulnerability in this sto story, and then we're going to share it. Now, I'm not going to talk much in detail about the key staff story because really that is someone else's personal story. So if you do that exercise, working with someone else and interview them to get their story, you will have gone through the process of being able to tell a story. I'll just tell you that if you're a salesperson, you are probably the least trustworthy, credible person in your organization. What I mean by that is salespeople have a bad reputation in most organizations, and your buyer is probably going to believe your technical expert or your CEO or your head of customer service more than they trust or believe you. So by telling a story about that other person, telling their personal story, you'll prime your, cl your client, your future customer, to believe that person. And this works very well. So by doing that pairing up exercise, you'll also learn the story of other people and you'll learn how to tell the other person's story, to tell their career story from their perspective. And that's really important. So I think we only have about 10 minutes left. So I'm going to move on to um, the company story. So most salespeople cannot tell their company story. They can't tell it as a narrative, as an interesting story. And I'm going to tell you a company story from one of my clients to give you an idea of how we construct a company story. The sequence is exactly the same as what you see behind me. It's, there's a setting, there's some complications, and then there's a resolution to make a business point. So the example I'm going to use is, um, <coughs> <coughs> The example I'm going to use is a company that I work with. It's not a particularly exciting company. They sell fire warden training. So their customers are building owners and they provide training to teach people how to safely evacuate from a building. So how to train up the fire wardens to evacuate the building. And um, this is them. That's the name. The company's called First Five Minutes. And it started off with uh, in 1986, an off-duty fireman, Ralph, now I'm starting my story, I'll just tell you there's a story, starting the story. Off-duty fireman, Ralph, he was, a, he was watching the news on TV at his home in the Sunshine Coast in Queensland. So there you go, setting, time and a place. And there was a news article about a fire at the Hamilton Island Resort. This is what it looks like today. Back in 1986, there weren't so many buildings. So there was a fire there. And Ralph could see that people were panicking and they were running all over the place and it looked like a complete catastrophe. And he thought to himself, there's a business there. I could teach building owners how to safely evacuate the building when there's a fire. And so he put together a little pack and he went and visited some big companies around Brisbane in Queensland. And he was successful. He managed to sell his program to some companies and he started work. But he wasn't a very good businessman and he ran out of money. So then he, um, he got, so that's a complication. So then he got some business partners to come in and help him provide some finance. And he started to get some big customers. So the AMP Bank and the NAB Bank, two of the biggest uh, banks and uh, insurance companies in Australia, became his clients. And then he needed to fly down to Sydney and Melbourne, which are two of the biggest cities in Australia, to deliver programs there. And then he needed to, hire some more staff. So he started opening a small office in Sydney and Melbourne, and it was the perfect time to start a fire compliance business because there was a building boom down the coast of Queensland. What's the Gold Coast now? What looks like Miami in the United States? So this was a perfect time to start a business. But um, Ralph was eventually bought out because he wasn't great at business, but the new owners came in and they invested more money into systems so that they were 
um, able to manage the compliance of a large number of different types of buildings. And they changed their company name from Ralph's company name to First Five Minutes after a fire training video on the Bradford Soccer Stadium disaster. And this is a picture of the Bradford St Soccer Stadium. It went up in flames and burnt down in five minutes and 56 people were killed. And that's a, a, a catastrophe that could have been avoided if they had been trained on, the stadium owners have been trained on how to fight the fire when it was just a cigarette fire in the, in the stadium. And there were a number of other things that came out of that particular disaster. So the company became known as First Five Minutes. Today they are in six capital cities in Australia and they're the largest building fire compliance company in Australia. So that's their, that's their company story. And it tells you how they started, some complications, why did they succeed? How did, why didn't they fail? Well, they nearly did fail because Ralph wasn't a very good businessman, but the company succeeded. And then where are they going? They're the largest company in Australia. We could add something to the end of the story and say, now they're buying up other companies and expanding into terrorist threat response and other areas we can put the company's strategy as the last point in the story. So the setting, this is the setting. And then we had some complications. So we had, firstly, we had the, the fire at Hamilton Island, and then we had Ralph starting a business, and then he couldn't manage the business, then we had new owners, and then we needed to go down to Sydney and Melbourne. So we had a few complications, and then we have the largest company in Australia doing this kind of business. We're putting, we're resolving to make a business point. And we're putting the facts of the company into the story. So when you tell the story like that, it doesn't sound like bragging. It just sounds like a normal narrative. You're just telling the story and we can hear what's happening and we understand how this company started how they grew, how they became important, all of those things. We're not giving facts about where the company's based and how big they are and how many staff. We're just putting that all into the story and then it's easy to listen to. So the setting, complication, resolution to a business point, largest company in all of the, uh, the major cities in Australia, then we make our point. How are we going for time, Austin? Oh, maybe a couple more minutes. If you can just wrap things up. We're right at the hour, so. So let me just launch a quick poll here. I'm going to launch. Um, sorry, Austin. Are you able to do that? Just launch the last poll. Can you see that, Mike? Uh, yeah, so poll open. Yeah, it's so, open. Right. So the question is, um, you know, having listened to personal story, would you be willing to think about telling your personal story in a first meeting with a client? Is that something that frightens you? Or is maybe that something that you already do? And just give us a yes, no answer on that. All right, five more seconds, I'm gonna close it. Cool. And then, can you see those results now? I managed to close that up. What percentage did we get? So we have 89% said yes and 11% said no. Yeah, look, so I'd like to talk to the 11%. Um, so there's a few reasons why people don't like the idea of telling a story. It seems confronting to tell your story. And, and a lot of people 
you know, a lot, a lot of times we're told that, um, you know, we should just listen and we should ask questions as salespeople. And it feels, um, maybe it feels to you um, like you shouldn't tell your story, that, that that's not relevant to the business. But I would like to encourage you to try and do it in a do it in a um, in a business meeting maybe where you you know it's not such an important one. Just try first in a meeting where um, um, where you um, it doesn't matter too much. What I'll tell you is if you tell your personal story and it didn't go so well, nobody's really going to notice. No, no one's going to um, to think badly of you. You'll just realize that you didn't tell it that well, and you'll think I should. I'll try to tell it better next time. But if you if you do it, what I think that you'll notice happening is that you'll tell that story, and they will tell you something. I can't predict for you what they'll tell you telling the story. But if your personal story is quite varied, if you have a little bit of a sequence of interesting things in your personal story, your client will tell you an interesting story back and you'll find that you know them much better and this is the clue this is this is how we build rapport this is where rapport starts so i highly encourage you that 11 percent to have a go just have a go at telling your personal story and notice the story that comes back so that's story number one and you're the central character now being and and just one more thing to say about the personal story. It's not a bragging story. We can't brag in our personal story. That's not going to go across well. We need to include things that went wrong in our career. We need to be a little bit vulnerable because if we don't, your client is not going to tell you a story back. They won't be comfortable to tell you a story back if your story is, is too heroic. You know, that's going to put them off. They won't tell you their story. And the purpose of telling your personal story is to share it's to hear their story the key staff story you can brag about your colleagues you can pump them up why not because you can tell a very nice story about them and they can tell a very nice story about you and this is something that i do with my business partners all the time i will tell my client how fantastic my business partner is and how experienced she is and how much she knows and all of that stuff and i do that because it doesn't sound like I'm bragging, I'm positioning my business partner, and she does the same thing for me. So it's a very good idea to tell a bragging story about other important people in your organization. Tell your client how great they are and tell it in a story, not as facts. Don't tell them this is the smartest person in the world. Tell them what they've done. Tell them the sequence of their career. And finally, I talked about one of my clients and I told you the story of first five minutes. And every company has an interesting story. Most companies fail. Something like 80% of all the companies that start are, are failures. They don't succeed after a year or two, they go bankrupt. So why did your company succeed? How did it succeed? That's an interesting story. And if you learn your company story, you will find that your buyer, your customer remembers your company and they identify with your company, they like your company, and they want to do business with you. So these stories are the start of liking and friendship and rapport. So that's what these first three stories are about. Okay, so that was uh, our webinar. We've talked about crafting stories. I've shown you the structure of stories, explain why we must tell them what stories are, and then we've looked at the first three stories, personal story, key staff story, and company story, which are stories for connection, for building rapport. The first problem a salesperson has is, how do I connect with a buyer? How do I get them to trust me? And that's done with stories. And next week, we're gonna go on to the deal-making stories, the stories that allow us to put new ideas in the mind of the customer, insight to tell them about other clients that have succeeded in success stories and also to tell stories that specifically help you close the deal.